My name is Tim Fox. Uh, I'm uh, with uh, Elephant Scale here. And uh, we, so I'm a consultant, uh, a trainer, and uh, also a developer of open source software. And uh, one of the things we're going to talk about to, uh, today is um, how to get started with machine learning in Python. Um, so I do a lot of speaking and training and that kind of thing. And people often ask me, oh, I'd really like to learn more about machine learning, AI, data science, and other kinds of related topics. So, um, but, you know, a lot of people say, well, how do I get started with that? Where do I, where do I get started with? A lot of times people don't even necessarily know what language uh, to do or what kind of environment that they should work with. So, um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at that. Obviously, there's a lot of different opinions on this subject, right? So, but we are going to be focused mainly on um, Python. Uh, and uh, as Python language, and I'll talk to you a little bit by why, but, but it's just, of course, Python as a language. We'll also talk about the environment and um, other things that we're going to um, use for that. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, I will go ahead and share my screen here. Okay. Okay. All right, so title of this presentation here. Oh, by the way, feel free to stop me and ask any questions that you may have. Um, and also, of course, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, be, um, we're going to have a time afterward to ask questions. But yeah, feel free to interrupt me, stop me. I think I unmuted all of you. So hopefully, you know, you should be able to ask questions. You can also do that in the chat if you like. Okay. So we're talking about getting started with ML and Python. Okay, so we'll talk a little bit about kind of Python as a language. We'll talk about how you can install that. Talk about different kinds of integrated development environments. We'll talk about Jupyter Notebooks. We'll also talk about just some different packages and environments for data science, machine learning, et cetera, and Python. Okay, now Python is a general purpose language. Um, it's actually one that we'll see later. It's one of the most popular languages out there. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of things you can do in Python. What we're interested in doing in Python is data science computing, graphics, and machine learning. So this is an open source language. It has a rich ecosystem. It's used for a lot of different things, uh, modeling, machine learning, ad hoc analytics, et cetera. Okay. Now, you might be wondering, well, wait a second here. Um, why would I want to choose Python? Aren't there other languages out there? Or I might already know Java, say, or R, or another language. And certainly, all those different languages um, are um, all, all those different languages are, uh, uh, are going to be useful in their own way. So it's not necessarily that you have to do with Python. But the vast, it is true though that, that probably the majority of people that work with machine learning, particularly with deep learning, do so in Python. Uh, so why? Why Python? Well, it's not so much that Python is a really special language. Um, it's, um, it's, uh, it is comprehensive. One of the things about it is, is that um, you can do pretty much anything you want to do in Python. Um, so if you had to take like one computer language with you to a desert island, um, assuming that you had a computer and internet on that desert island, then, <laughs> then you might take Python. So, um, it also has, so it also has very good graphics capabilities. So there's great kind of visualization available. Um, and another thing is, is that it's gained ground in data science because it's designed for interactive analysis, right? So, Python is a dynamic language, so we can do, do that in real time uh, in, in a dynamic oriented environment. Um, it's similar in that way to like R and JavaScript, and unlike, say, Java, for example, which is not a dynamic language. Um, it's also open source, so open source is, of course, free in terms of cost. But also, uh, open source has another advantage in that open source is a community, a community developed platform. And it's no surprise that the world of AI and data science is built in this open source environment. Um, so the, the standard tools that we all use, we'll talk about some of those, they're all for the most part open source. Um, and that's the kind of environment that we, um, that we develop in. Is, and so it's, of course, the cost of open source is free, but that's probably really not really the main reason why open source is valuable. It's mainly because of the, uh, the community aspect of the open source uh, in, environment. Now, with Python, we can read from pretty much any format that our data might be in. 
Python's also extensible. So there's lots of libraries in the Python package index, which is open source. And in fact, one of the advantages of open source is that we get kind of bleeding edge kind of stuff uh, before you would get that in commercial software. I mean, the world is largely moving away from commercial software in the area, in this area, right? So, um, and so the power of open source means that if you want the latest and greatest of what people is doing, then you're going to find the GitHub repository and you're going to clone that and use that. There's lots of different IDEs. We'll talk about some of those. Also, given, of course, that it's open source, Python runs on basically any platform, basically everything from Apple Watches, believe it or not, to all the way up to supercomputers are all going to run on Python, right? Run, run Python as a language, right? So definitely any platform that one could possibly dream up, certainly you can run Python on that environment, right? So, um, so this is actually in your slide, so I'm not going to go into this in great depth. But Python has been, um, uh, 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 Python actually is, uh, is, uh, is um, oh, actually, hang on. I thought we were, um, uh, so, so can everyone see my, they see like my screen okay? I just wanna make sure that that is visible to everyone. Can somebody give me a heads up on that? Okay. Uh, so I see those hands raised, actually. Uh, does anybody have any questions there? Um, so now let's go and, and refer to the chat here. Um, okay. So by the way, somebody asked about the PDF. So I will give you the link for the PDF again. Um, it's, it, go ahead and uh, send that out to everybody. Actually, I'm not sure I sent it to everybody. So let me just go ahead and make sure that we get the PDF for everybody. Here. And a question here is about uh, uh, recording. Uh, we are doing a recording. So we're gonna try to make that available well uh, to all those who um, are uh, uh, all those who are there. Um, by the way, um, let me also, if you're interested in that, let me go ahead and get a, uh, uh, get a, um, a, uh, uh, so uh, we'll go ahead and get um, that. We actually have a system which we can use for uh, collecting uh, and distributing that sort of thing. So um, I will actually get that to you in a minute here. So yeah, but anyway, that's the PDF that I gave you here. Okay. Um, so, all right. So the Zen of Python, actually I'll refer to that here, your reference. Uh, Python of course is a dynamic language and it has sort of a philosophy and culture behind it. One that does happen to, to kind of go pretty well with the world of data science and machine learning, right? So. Um, so you can see here, beautiful is better than ugly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So one of the things that Guido von Rossum, the guy who created Python originally, he wanted a language that was both dynamic in the sense that it had a very kind of, we could dynamically uh, run an interactive code. It is an interpreted language, but he also wanted one that was object oriented and also one in which uh, good programming practice could be followed. Uh, so like Java in that sense, but more like JavaScript in the sense of being a dynamic language, right? So um, it is, so it's dynamically typed. So that means is that uh, it's called duck typing. So that means if it walks like a duck, you know, doing that feature, it features automatic type conversion. Um, it features uh, just in time compilation. So that means we don't compile, have to compile and build Python code. We can just run it dynamically. Although we can do that if we want to actually. Um, and, um, and also it has a, what's called a REPL shell, which stands for read, evaluate, print loop. That means that we can run Python code interactively. And, and, and do it. in fact, when we run Jupyter Notebooks and other things that we're gonna see, that is uh, how we do that. We do that with an interactive mode. So, okay, so now if you're new to Python, there's actually one thing that you'll immediately come into. There's actually um, three different kind of trees of Python, albeit Python one is not used. It's very old, not used anymore, however, Python 2 and Python 3 are both still being used. And if you're new to Python, you'll experience this. Um, so um, if you want my advice, I would say to go ahead and, and try to choose Python 3 if you can. 
Python 2 is deprecated and it is kind of slowly going away, although there are some people who are diehards that are kind of continue to uh, hold on to Python 2. Uh, unfortunately, there are some differences between Python 2 and Python 3. Um, and so that's one reason why people have held on to Python 2 for long. I'm not actually going to go into the details, but that's something that in your slides you can refer to. Um, so there are some differences. Probably the most annoying thing that you'll see is that when you do a print statement in Python 2, you don't use parenthesis, but in Python 3, you do. So the, the differences are small, but they're enough that, you know, it can be an annoyance if you have some code for Python uh, 2, Python 3. So now I recommend use Python 3 because it's been around for a long time and they're really trying to get a push toward Python 3 now. So if you can, do that. Now, a lot of people, in fact, somebody just asked me this question in the chat. What about Python versus R? And in fact, this is a little bit kind of a, a kind of a very uh, uh, active debate because both languages in the world of machine learning data science are very popular. Um, as a matter of fact, in traditional data analytics, like you know, um, R may be in fact more more popular than Python um, because uh, now there are some differences though. Um, R is a, a specialized language which was originally designed for statistics and analytics, right? So you're not gonna be making your next game or website with R, right? So it's a very specialized language for that purpose. Whereas Python, you could probably make a game or website, but a lot of people do, right? So it's a general purpose language, right? So that's one difference. Um, another difference is, is that Python uses an object-oriented approach. So when Python came out in the 90s, that was kind of a new thing. Now it's sort of standard, everything is object-oriented. R, though, is not really particularly object-oriented. There are some, maybe some aspects of it that are object-oriented, but typically it actually follows some different paradigms, like procedural or functional paradigms. And in fact, if you're a purist as far as languages, you'd probably say that R doesn't seem to be able to pick an approach. It seems to use a lot of different kind of hodgepodge of different approaches. Um, so um, I think another, it's one thing they both have in common is they both have very large package repositories. Python has PyPy, the Python package index. R has CRAN. Now, obviously, PyPy has way more packages than CRAN does. But if we say specifically for the area of data analytics and, and, and statistical programming and things like that, both of them are very competitive in terms of their both functionality. Both have very rich package ecosystems. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say one is better than the other, although certain aspects, like so, for example, in deep learning, We'll talk about that later. I'd say Python clearly has an edge in that area. But then there's probably some areas where R would have an edge too. Um, so they're both dynamic languages. So uh, that's good. Um, both languages have different IDEs. We'll talk about those for Python. R has a very nice RDE called R, I'm sorry, IDE called R Studio. Now, if you're not familiar, IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. It's basically the app that you use to code in. And R has one called R Studio that I'd say 90% of our users use. It's really nice, actually. In fact, I all I sometimes I wish that there was something quite as nice for Python. Actually, there's lots of great IDs for Python, but R Studio is very heavily kind of integrated with the language, and it's really nice. Um, so Python culture again, there's no standard IDE. Everyone has their own favorite, and there's many different ones. We'll talk about that later. Um, one thing people ask me: Well, should I use Python or should I use R? Well, I usually ask you kind of, what's your background? So if they say, oh, I'm a developer, I majored in CS. In that case, I almost always say use Python. So if they say, well, I, I majored in stats and my background is more in terms of analytics and kind of come from that background. Well, in that case, I would say R. And that's just because R was originally developed by statisticians, not programmers. So that pretty much kind of tells you most of what you need to know. A lot of the terminology and other things is very familiar to those who have a background in statistics, actuarial science, you know, kind of data science in the very traditional sense of the word, right? So all those things, again, might find R more comfortable, right? So uh, whereas if your background is more as a software developer and or if you're, you know, if you have a machine learning kind of CS type background, then uh, you might be more comfortable in Python. You know, again, that's, your mileage may vary there. Um, so again, though, both languages have grown a lot toward each other. Originally, Python and R would have seemed to have very little in common, right? R was a bunch of stats, you know, stats people doing that. Python is just developers. But, you know, a thing is things have grown together, right? So, in fact, um, the Anaconda distribution that we're going to talk about, it features both Python and R. In fact, you can even mix and match Python and R together. 
Although if you're using Anaconda, you're probably more of a Python person. But again, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. I mean, I'm more of a Python person myself, but I do some stuff in R too, because sometimes there's a package in R that I really like that does something good. So I, that's fine. I can, you know, within the Anaconda environment, I can mix and match all the R and Python packages I want, and I can use them together, right? So, all right, well, what about Python versus Java? Well, both languages are, uh, one of the biggest differences, Java is a statically typed language. So statically typed means is that types are what they are and they don't change. And for developing very robust kind of maintainable software, especially in production, that's really nice. Um, however, if you're trying to do more of a dynamic environment, it can be a bit of a straitjacket, right? So, so that's one difference, right? Java is known to be very kind of verbose and it's also, uh, you know, uh, so again, it's a kind of a different thing for a different purpose, right? A Python is very interactive. Java is not, it doesn't have that REPL we talked about. Um, Java, again, now Java does have some advantages in terms of how you can deploy though. Uh, in Java, we can build like what's called a fat jar. We can build our dependencies together. Java has a lot of tools for dependency management. So um, I would say Java isn't used a lot for interactive analytics, but it is used a lot kind of for making production apps that involve analytics, right? So um, Python is, is, is slower than in native Java code. Although we'll talk about how we can get better speed in Python by using native code. So, but again, just general apples to apples, like Python code versus Java code. Java code's generally gonna be faster, right? So um, that's because Python's interpreted, right? So interpreted code is generally somewhat slower than compiled code, right? So now the language that is an interpreted dynamic language that probably most of you know is JavaScript, right? Everybody knows JavaScript. Um, so uh, that's because JavaScript is so widely used in the, on the web and also in terms of server-side apps like using Node.js, right? So Python and JavaScript have a lot in common. They're both dynamic languages. They both can run packages. There's a lot in common. Obviously, you can't use Python as like client-side script, right? That's kind of one special thing JavaScript has. Um, so the language, the core language is kind of similar, but there's some really significant differences. One thing is, is that JavaScript has a very minimalistic standard library because it has to run inside of your browser, right? So it can't be too big. Whereas Python has a very vast kind of standard library, right? So um, another difference is, is that um, uh, JavaScript is very rarely ever used for data science or machine learning, right? So it is sometimes used for deployment. For example, you have to deploy things in, in your script. So yeah, it can be used for that. But in terms of development, almost never. Right, so um, they tend to be used for very distinct purposes, right? So JavaScript is gonna be tend to use more for web programming. Python is gonna be used for science, data science, AI, you know, that kind of data, data manipulation, that kind of thing, right, so. Now on Stack Overflow, Python has become the most popular language. Now, again, it's overtaken JavaScript and Java and other languages. Now, again, your mileage may vary. I mean, I'm not saying that there's not a lot of people using other languages. But the fact that Python has grown a lot in popularity is undeniable, right? You can see kind of the trends that are here. Um, so uh, one thing that's about Python, it has, you know, doesn't have a lot of fuss, right? So, you know, as a dynamic language, you know, want to do hello world, we just say print hello world. That's all we got to do. Compare that to say other languages, which are a lot more verbose. Okay. So we talked about different use cases for Python. Again, we're not going to talk about a lot of these things. Yes, we can do microservices and all that. We're mainly interested down here, right? Data analytics, data science, machine learning, deep learning, AI, right? That's what we're going to talk about. Now, Python is an interpreted language. So that means it's going to be relatively slow for Python code. But there is an alternative to that. We can actually compile Python code into C, C++ code and then integrate that together with native C++ code. So when we do a lot of our number crunching in AI, very little of that is pure Python code. Almost none of it is. Most of it is native code, usually written in C, C++. But if it's compiled, now we all know C, C++ can be very fast, especially if you optimize it well. So whenever you're running like TensorFlow or something like that, you know, it's, it, it's kind of orchestrated from Python. And 99% of the time we, we run it from Python. But the underlying code is not Python, right? It's C, C++, right? So, and that's done for speed. So it's designed to get kind of the best of both worlds. We run it kind of in a dynamic interpreted environment, but when we need lots of heavy number crunching, that's gonna be all done in 
native C, C++ code. So in that sense, it's like the pure Python code is slow, but we can integrate it with C++ or Fortran, believe it or not. There's a lot of Fortran still out there. Uh, and that native code is going to be fast, right? So, um, but again, at the high level, kind of stuff that's not performance sensitive, Python is so much easier and so user-friendly compared to that low-level C, C++, right? So we can do a lot of in Python there. It's easy, but when we need the speed, we can do that, right? So that's kind of the workflow that we do. Okay, so let's talk about how we can do this. Now, for data science, almost most people use something called Anaconda, right? So what's Anaconda? Well, Anaconda is a distribution of Python. So now Python, it comes on your machine. If, if, if you run on any OS other than Windows, I'd say probably every OS under the sun today other than Windows comes, comes with Python, right? Even your Apple Watch comes with Python. Even your iPhone comes with Python, right? They all do. Uh, in, it, that's because they're based on, on Unix, right? Only, the only OS today that's not based on Unix is Windows, right? So, but even on Windows, you can very easily install and run Python. Uh, in fact, Microsoft themselves is trying to make that as easy as possible, right? So, so the fact is you probably already have Python installed on your computer. But um, Python is used for a lot of things, right? And so um, Anaconda is a Python distribution particularly for ML and data science, right? So, so um, you can install that. Now, there are a few Python experts that may kind of say, ah, I don't need Anaconda. And if you're in that category, fine. You know, again, uh, you probably know what you're doing. You probably know how you like to work. If you're new to this though, and we're getting started, I highly, highly, highly recommend doing Anaconda. So if you're a Windows users, user, I would say there's, I mean, you'd be crazy not to use Anaconda. And we'll talk a little bit of, of, of one there, but even if you're a Linux user or a Mac user, um, you know, Anaconda has a lot of advantages. So um, go ahead, you can go ahead to uh, the, the um, anaconda.com. So if I just go here to anaconda.com, right? And so, um, so if you go here, you can download this for your platform. Uh, so again, whatever your platform is, I'm running, I happen to be running on Linux here, but you can run on Windows, Mac, that's fine. In fact, as I said before, for Windows users, Anaconda is an absolute lifesaver. So, um, so you're, I recommend the Python 3.7, not Python 2.7, unless you have a really, really good reason why you need Python 2.7, I would highly recommend that. So just go and click on download here. And you can go ahead and um, download that. I don't need it now. I already have it installed. But you know, you can go ahead and download that for your platform. Now it's pretty big, and um, in fact, once it installs, it'll get even bigger. One of the things that Anaconda does is it installs all the commonly used packages for data science and machine learning. So, um, uh, so, uh, uh, so that means that. Um, uh, so uh, that, that means it's going to use up a lot of disk space on your hard drive if you're downloading all that. But the nice thing is, is that it's all there. So you don't have to waste time downloading and, and configuring all the common packages. So, um, so I highly recommend doing that. If you want a more minimalistic Anaconda, there's something called Miniconda. And Miniconda gives you only the... Um, uh, uh, only the um, only the the minimalistic things that you can kind of go sort of a la carte on your own. But I recommend that more for experienced users. As a beginner, I mean, you have hard disk space, right? You have a few gigs you can spend on Anaconda. Just go ahead and just install all that. That's what I'd say. Okay, so uh, we talked about the reason why I use Anaconda. Now, again, one of the reasons, one nice thing is Anaconda builds everything for you. So a lot of users, particularly Windows users, don't have C, C++ compilers already installed, right? So again, if you happen to be a Windows developer, then maybe you do. But again, most developers probably don't. You probably don't have, do you have Visual Studio installed on your Windows machine? Probably not. So again, for a basic Python, you'd need that in order to build that. But for Anaconda, they build everything for you and then they just give you the binary. So that's nice. Actually, um, they also give you kind of a native, you know, kind of experience, you know, so you can install it like, you know, Microsoft installer on Windows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? They also kind of sell you kind of, this free, but they'll also sell you a commercial support. Most big enterprise users pay for the support. And then that means you get a, a, a supported package. If you work for like a more traditional enterprise, that, that's going to be really important, right? Now, we said before, 
most most operating systems like Mac or Linux, et cetera, other than Windows come with Python. In fact, Mac, for example, uses Python for a lot of internal stuff behind the scenes. So you already have Python. So why should you install Anaconda? Well, in some ways it's an advantage, right? Because the system level stuff that your Mac OS is doing, say, or for example, Linux or whatever is doing, again, you just want to let it do that, right? So if you, for the data science work, then we probably want to have a, a separate Python that, so that they won't step on each other's toes, right? So that's another good reason to consider using it. Okay. Now, again, I said some people, a lot of people, particularly really experienced Python developers, say, ah, I don't need Anaconda. I use Python every day. Da, 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 da. Okay. So if you're in that category, it's fine, right? So, however, if you are already using Python, I highly recommend using virtual environments. And if you're experienced Python users, you, should, you know what I'm talking about. So a virtual environment, keep separate virtual environments for your data science work as you do for whatever other Python, web development or whatever else you're doing with Python, right? So in fact, generally I recommend for every project, whether you use Anaconda or otherwise, put a new virtual environment. Okay, now um, when, we, when we talk about Python, of course, you know, we can go ahead and create a, uh, we can go ahead and, and, uh, and, and you start programming into Python, right? So for example, if I go ahead, you know, if I just go to the command prompt and I type in Python, boom, I can say, hello, print, hello world, right? So, ta-da, you know, I have Python, right? Now notice here that I ran Python here at the command line and lo and behold, it's running Anaconda. That's because I have the Anaconda Python in my path, right? Okay, now, I can run Python from the command line, right? That's all very well and good. Uh, but in practice, you probably aren't gonna do a lot of coding on the command line, right? Unless you're, you know, again, if you are, more power to you. But again, most people prefer to use an IDE. And there's lots of different IDEs out there, right? So people ask me, especially if you're coming from another programming language, especially if you're a Java developer, first thing you're probably gonna ask me is, well, what IDE do I want to use, right? Because Java people tend to spend most of their lives in IDEs, which is great. I mean, there's different styles, you know. So, so there's a lot of different ones. Now, um, now within Anaconda, it actually gives us a lightweight IDE called Spider. So, in fact, I'll just go ahead and start that. I'm running on Linux, so I'm just going to run that from the command line. But of course, in your in Windows or whatever, in your start menu, all that. Okay. So this is Spider. So Spider is a very lightweight IDE. It's designed to be a bit like RStudio, but unfortunately, RStudio fans, it's not as good. I'm sorry. Uh, but it does the job. If you want kind of a lightweight, um, a lightweight kind of RDE, that's the one good thing about Spider. Very lightweight, um, and it's fast and streamlined. And it is designed for kind of science and data science work, right? So it's, you know, again, it's not probably going to be your ID you're going to use if you're going to make like microservices or something. But for data science, if you want a lightweight, no fuss IDE, it'll do the job for you, right? So I can start typing in Python code here. I'm saying print hello. If I say like, um, you know, import numpy as np, if I say np.array, you know, um, right? So, um, so if I, excuse me a second here. Um, right, so if I go ahead and uh, do this now, I just create a NumPy array. Again, I'm just showing you, for example, I got some Python code. I can do that interactively. Now, if I want to do the same thing here, I can start typing in Python. So I say import NumPy P my array equals array. Right. All right. So if I go ahead now, so now I, what I can do is I can, I can run this. Ta-da. You can say, okay, go ahead and run that. All right. Bit. All right. Now, if I select print, you know, print my array, you can see here I have IntelliSense, you know, so, you know, basic IDE that I have here. I can go ahead and do that. I can even do things like set breakpoints, you know, so here, for example, if I go debug, I can say set a breakpoint, just set a breakpoint, right? Now I can go ahead and run. So all the normal stuff that you'd expect, right? You can do that in Spider. Okay, so that's Spider. Um, it does come with Anaconda and it's very nice. Now, okay, so, but a lot of you, particularly if you're coming from another programming language, you're gonna say, yeah, 
that's nice, but that doesn't really look like, you know, I, I probably want a more full feature ID. What do we have for it? All right. So, um, well, uh, you can, for example, use PyCharm. Now, if you're a fan of JetBrains, uh, they produce IntelliJ and a number of other um, IDEs. And they tend to be very high quality work. Everybody loves JetBrains, especially on the Java side. They're really good for that. Uh, they have a Python IDE too by the name of PyCharm. So, um, so PyCharm is, if you, again, if you like uh, IntelliJ, if, you, if you're kind of a fan of that, then you're gonna like PyCharm too. Um, it's, uh, it, it kind of basically does sort of the same thing that IntelliJ does. Uh, in fact, I have PyCharm Community Edition installed here on this particular computer. So um, again, if you're, uh, I'm not going to probably spend a lot of time demoing it, but again, that is um, that is PyCharm. So um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and run that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, all right. So so here's PyCharm. Now, one disadvantage of PyCharm is that um, PyCharm is, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, create a project here. PyCharm is pretty heavyweight. So, um, you know, it's just like, uh, like IntelliJ, actually, or Eclipse, right? So you're not going to be running this on your, you know, uh, you're, is, you know, you need a lot of memory and everything. And most IDEs in general, right, are pretty stiff in terms of requirements, right? So, so yeah, but you know, you have this here. I can go in, I just create my project. Uh, you can see here it actually set up and, and you know, I can configure that. So, so again, if you, in fact, if, again, if you, you're familiar with how, um, uh, I can go ahead and uh, create a new file here. So I just create a new file here, right? I can start typing in Python. All right, you get the idea, right? Now, um, my criticism of PyCharm is a little bit heavyweight. It, you know, again, um, it also runs in Java, which is fine, but it's a little bit heavyweight. Um, so what else is there, right? So, well, uh, one IDE that's gained a lot of fans is Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Now, um, if any of you are kind of have a, are, are, are kind of a, not a fan of Microsoft um, because of whatever, actually a lot of open source developers are big fans of Visual Studio Code, even if you are not, even if you're a Microsoft, a lot of Microsoft haters love Visual Studio uh, Code, that is. In fact, uh, it is also distinct from the traditional desktop Visual Studio, right, which is mainly designed for Windows apps, right? So this is... Uh, uh, going to be mainly designed for, um, well, it's a, for a lot of things, web apps, but also Python apps as well. So um, Visual Studio Code is, I, I'd say, grow, growing a lot in popularity. And one of the reasons why is that Visual Studio Code is a lot lighter weight than PyCharm, which makes it really good for data science kind of stuff. Uh, you know, so, but also... Um, it's, it's a lot more tr full featured and, uh, you know, Microsoft, of course, makes their desktop version of Visual Studio, right? So, um, you know, it has an experience similar to that, but it's like 10 times faster than that one. Um, and it also is, it's, so it's, it's kind of a great kind of happy medium between being weight, but also kind of comfortable if you are a developer from come, kind of a traditional IDE. So a lot of people that develop for data science and machine learning do like Visual Studio Code for that reason. So anyway, so that's Visual Studio Code. Um, there are other options. There's, uh, uh, there is uh, PyDev, Pi which is basically like Eclipse. So if you uh, are a fan of Eclipse, again, a lot of us have been using Eclipse since you know, we were like kids, you know, so it's been around since forever. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, so that's, that's, there's lots of other options, right? So some people like Vim or Sublime Text or whatever text editor you want. One of the things about Python is, is that the community is not very dogmatic when it comes to tools, right? So, um, you know, unlike like kind of the Microsoft universe or like, for example, even R where there's kind of a very standard set of tools in Python, it's kind of like anything goes, whatever floats your boat, you know? So one disadvantage to that, though, is it means that there's just a lot of different tools out there, and there's not really a lot of standards out there, right? So, 
Okay, now, some of you are probably asking, well, what about Jupyter Notebook? What, where does that fit in with IDE? Well, Jupyter Notebook is a very, very commonly used tool in data science. And in fact, it's a great place for showcasing kind of your working Python code and also for interactively evaluating it. So it allows you to kind of combine your text, HTML images, visualizations, and your runnable Python code together. And it uses kind of a document paradigm rather than a code module paradigm. So, so, um, so that actually is really nice. Um, now, it's not an IDE, right? So if you're expecting Jupyter Notebook to be an IDE, it's not actually. Um, think of it more like if you could kind of write your documentation in such a way that your documentation could kind of run code live, right? So think of it more in those terms. So here's an example of like a Jupyter Notebook, right? So we have some code, but with that code, we kind of see our visualizations there. So it's kind of like a live document. It makes a great demo. Like if you go to a conference or something like that, um, 99% of the time, you're going to see a Jupyter Notebook as part of that conference presentation. Um, and that's just because Jupyter Notebooks just make a great way to kind of showcase sort of what you're doing. It may or may not be the best tool for developing the code in the first place. But again, it can be useful for that too. Um, but it's, uh, it is a great way to do that. So what is Jupyter? Well, uh, Jupyter actually used to be called IPython. Um, actually, it changed the name to Jupyter because um, the project supposedly works in other languages too. So the J, for example, in Jupyter stands for Java. In practice, the vast majority of Jupyter notebooks are in fact Python, but in theory, right? So you can do that. Um, so uh, now the way that you can run Jupyter notebooks, it's included again with Anaconda. So you can go to wherever you want to run. And actually, if you just, now one way to do it is you can run this from the uh, command line, right? So let me go ahead and close Spider. So, um, so let's just go ahead and um, let's go ahead and, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll try running a uh, Jupyter Notebook here. So, okay. So, uh, so for example, um, if I go ahead and run, um, if I go ahead and run my Jupyter Notebooks here, you can give me a second here. Um, okay. So if I could say Jupyter. Now there's two actually applications. One is Jupyter Notebook. So Jupyter Notebook is mainly designed for doing kind of like a single document, right? So if I go ahead, I type in Jupyter Notebook, and then that opens up in my, in my browser here. Now, for example, if I go and I look at um, here, right? So, right, so here I have a notebook here um, that's called Hello Jupyter, right? So, um, so here we go. So um, now I'm, I'm running this here. So here, Jupyter is based on some different stuff. So if I go now, what I can do is I can click on this cell, right? So um, what I can do now is I can go ahead and type in some Python code, right? So let me go ahead and, uh... all right. So I typed in some Python code. And now what I can do is I click the play button here. You can see it runs my Python code and I can see what happens. Um, so Jupyter also has some limited kind of IntelliSense and other things. Now, if you're expecting something like IntelliJ or Visual Studio, you'll probably be disappointed. But it does have some limited IntelliSense. So for example, if I say like this, and now if I say like a dot, and use like tab completion here, you can see like, so for example, I found there's a method here called capitalize, right? So if I say a dot capitalize here, Okay, and you can see here that um, it took the uh, beginning here uh, one and capitalized it there. Actually, it was already um, it was already actually capitalized. Um, uh, so if I say like so, for example, lower. There we go. So um, all right. So we can do some limited kind of tab completion. Um, you know, we also can get help. So for example, uh, if I uh, use the question mark here, it comes and brings up, okay. So A is a string, 
and it tells me kind of what, you know, some of the things in a string is. This is equivalent to the Java docs, for example, if you're familiar with that. And so, for example, um, let's say I need some help on this one, like L strip function. You can see here, okay. So um, it says L strip is going to return a copy of the string with leading white space removed. Aha, okay. So if I say, like, so for example, uh, if I want to try that and I like have a string here, like, yada, 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 hello, right? And then I say, like, L strip. All right, so you can see that L strip function just remove the initial white space. Okay, so that's Jupyter Notebook. Jupyter Notebook is a great analytical tool. Um, you know, we also can, uh, you know, we also can do visualizations and stuff in, in Jupyter Notebook, which is kind of cool. Now, instead of using Jupyter Notebook, I actually recommend something else called Jupyter Lab. So if we go ahead and close this, if we say Jupyter Lab instead of Jupyter Notebook, so, um, Jupyter Lab is a little bit more like an IDE. So one nice thing about it is, is that we could open up different tabs. So imagine it's kind of like a tab browser, right? So we can go ahead and load some uh, tabs, you know, and um, so, uh, so for example, I'm loading up this one here. And notice here it's in a tab, you can do that. I can also, in fact, if I want to get like a terminal shell, so you can see here, here is a terminal shell I'm getting here. Obviously, this is going to be for, you know, Unix-ish systems, right? But uh, again, this is great for like if you're running on a server and you don't want to SSH into it, you can just do that. Um, you know, also, uh, when we go here, we can also do a... Um, uh, we, so we can do terminal, we can get a new notebook, right? Um, we also can uh, edit like markdown files and other things like that. So that's Jupyter Lab. I highly recommend Jupyter Lab, actually. So Jupyter Lab, I think, is a great kind of also another, it's, 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 it's not really an IDE, but it kind of does the job, right? So if you were doing, especially for interactive kind of an analysis, it's good for that. Okay, so that is, um, you know, our talk about uh, Jupyter uh, Notebook and Jupyter Lab and all that. Um, so, um, Let's talk a little bit about common packages in ML. Okay, so now one of the basic packages we have is NumPy. Now, NumPy is important because pretty much everything we do in Python depends on it, right? So what is NumPy? Well, NumPy is kind of like Python's answer to MATLAB, right? Except for the fact that probably way more people use Python now than MATLAB, right? So, but again, it basically gives you Python kind of the same sort of things that MATLAB does, right? linear algebra, math, statistical functions, other things like that. And it does it really, really, really fast, right? So Python code, as we said, is not very fast, unfortunately. It's interpreted, right? It's not really designed to be fast. But the NumPy code is about as fast as you would expect kind of just native C++ to be, right? So it allows you to do a lot of fast number crunching, right? So now we probably don't do a lot of analytics directly in that NumPy, but it is the base for everything that we do. And there's a companion package, which is not mentioned in the slides, called SciPy. SciPy basically uses NumPy in order to solve a lot of different kind of scientific problems. Not necessarily data science, but that too, right? But all kinds of science, right? So, okay. Now, another essential package is Pandas. So, Pandas package actually is, um, allows us to do data manipulation using um, something called data frames. Now, those of you who are um, familiar with um, R language, right? So R language features uh, a lot of manipulation with data frames. What's a data frame? Well, it's basically like a tabular kind of view of your data, right? So, so for example, I'm gonna go back to my uh, Jupyter, uh, Jupyter lab here, right? And um, so, so for example, I'll just kind of quickly show you kind of an example of what a uh, Pandas data frame looks like. Okay, so you can see here, um, I'm using pandas here, and I'm loading myself uh, s some data here. Th namely, in this case, it's uh, so that this NYC flights data set, right? So, um, so uh, now notice here, this looks a lot like a spreadsheet, right? And in fact, a data frame looks a lot like a spreadsheet. Um, but it's a, one of our basic uh, tools we're gonna use for 
um, basically manipulating and analyzing data. Now, again, Pandas is not going to probably train any machine learning models for us, but it's still essential because analytics and analysis and, and, and data munging, data transformation, data cleanup, all of this is really important, right? You can also do aggregates and other things like that. So Pandas almost single-handedly gives us some great kind of data analytical tools that we can use in Python. In fact, it kind of is sort of Python's example, the kind of answer to R, right? So R does a lot of these things kind of in the base language, whereas Python gives us this in the package, Pandas package, right? So, so. all right. Now, um, uh, so, now, probably the most popular general purpose ML library, I'd say in any language, is called scikit-learn. So scikit-learn is an essential package for Python. Basically, every Python developer who does, does work in data science or machine learning has it installed, right? Now, it is, um, now I say general purpose because we're, you know, there's other ML packages that may be more popular in terms of number of users, but they are, um, they are, uh, they are not necessarily kind of a, a general ML library, right? So, so scikit-learn allows us to do a lot of ML stuff in Python, right? Classification, regression, recommendations, cluster, and similarity. It's going to be installed by default for you in your Anaconda. So if I go, for example, to my Jupyter Notebook here, and I open up a new cell, and I say, you know, import sklearn, Right, so there it is, right? It's already installed. So in fact, um, you know, if you're, so it, it's already there for us and it does so many great things for us, right? So even if we're using other kinds of ML libraries too, we're still gonna use scikit-learn because it does a lot of things for us. Um, and so, um, so that's, uh, that's, that's uh, scikit-learn, right? So uh, now let's talk a little bit about deep learning. Now, again, we're kind of running out of time. So I'm not gonna discuss all the ins and outs of deep learning. But if there's one area I'd say in which Python has a clear lead as an environment over other languages, say like R, um, it's clearly in the area of deep learning, right? So, um, so what do we mean by deep learning? You know, so deep learning uses neural networks and problems such as, for example, image recognition, uh, text, uh, natural language analysis and understanding, other problems like that tend to use deep learning. Right. So now, of course, many other areas as well. But those, for example, are some areas that we would normally turn to deep learning um, as an approach. Right. Now, there's a lot of common packages. TensorFlow, for example, a lot of you probably heard of that. It's a Google supplied deep learning library among the most popular libraries out there in AI today. It is, although the core of it is written in C++, it runs in Python. Right. So if you are doing work with machine learning, you're going to be using TensorFlow to some extent, right? So um, now there are other packages. Keras, for example, has a very popular and user-friendly API, which TensorFlow itself actually uses now. Um, PyTorch, for example, is extremely popular, has a lot of users. And it's actually, in terms of popularity, it's probably about equal with TensorFlow now. And there's many others, right? So a lot of more specialized libraries. So um, anyway, so if you are going to be interested in doing work with neural networks and deep learning, um, you're going to be using Python for that. Because uh, uh, again, I'm not saying, you know, again, R, for example, can use TensorFlow and Keras. I'm not saying you can't, but um, the vast majority of users uh, kind of, of the, if your main thing is to do that, you're probably going to be using that. So anyway, that is, um, those packages are there. Now, um, with Anaconda, we can easily install all of these packages using the Anaconda uh, package management system called Conda. So we can install that. Uh, those packages are all available. Not actually installed by default, just because not everybody does deep learning, but um, it, is, uh, it is there, you know, uh, uh, and, and that is there. Okay, so we have a little bit of time left. I'm sure some of you asked some questions here. So let me just go ahead and try to address some of those. Um, uh, so, yeah. So, anyway, uh, let me just open that up. We have, like, about, you know, 10 minutes or so before we are, um, before we are, uh, uh, you know, needing to finish for the day. So, I uh, just wanted to uh, get some, uh, any, any questions that we might have here.
Okay, so, um, uh, all right, so I, we got a couple questions here. Jorge asked about how to distribute Python projects. So um, that is a good question. Um, so um, I'm not actually sure if you're talking about, Jorge, maybe you can clarify. Are you talking about distributed in the sense of how to develop distributed processing? Uh, for example, uh, uh, kind of partitioning our data and, um, oh, okay, so I see. Yeah, I see you're talking about. So in Python, actually, there is no equivalent to a, like a fat jar like there is in Java. Um, uh, so one of the ways that actually we can do that is actually using Docker, right? So with Docker, we can create a Docker file and the Docker file can basically bundle all of the Python with all of the dependencies into a, um, a Docker uh, container. So that's one way to do it. Um, uh, so other than that, though, the standard way we do this is, is that basically we have a file called requirements.txt, which has all the packages we need and the versions. And then there's a, there's kind of a build process where we build and install that usually in a virtual environment. Uh, but one of the, one, and that's in fact, one of the reasons why we have virtual environments is the fact that typically when we have an app, we need to run in a virtual environment so that way that we don't have um, dependency hell problems between different versions of packages in different, in, in different environments. So yeah, so that's a couple solutions. We can use kind of the standard package mechanism with Python uh, in a virtual environment, or another option is, is we, can, um, we can use a Docker container. Okay. Um, so yes, we are recording that. Actually, I'm going to have to, uh, we'll, we'll send out, I think we have an email list here, so we'll send out some information on where to get the recording um, after the fact. It's actually currently being recorded, yeah. So mm -hmm. um, let's see. So um, Jose actually asked about IoT applications. So in IoT applications, again, a Python certainly can be used in that area. Um, and and certain IoT type of data is, usually falls generally under the same type of category as time series uh, type data, right? So typically when we have IoT applications, maybe we have a sensor or something like that. So we have uh, there. So certainly with machine learning in Python, we can definitely uh, develop analytical models around that kind of data, like real time time series type of data. So very common use case. On the deployment side, of course, we, you know, we also call it inference side. When we have machine learning models, it's very common for us to want to push our machine learning models to, um, to uh, the, the kind of the deployment side, right? So let's say, for example, we have uh, some kind of, you know, application that involves like a sensor somewhere, right? So we may want to deploy a machine learning model um, to that environment, right? So and um, there's a number of uh, ways that we can do that. Actually, um, TensorFlow library, for example, uh, supports a TensorFlow uh, runtime, which can be deployed in a lot of different environments. So for example, there's a TensorFlow.js, which is designed for kind of web environments. We also have TensorFlow environments we designed for embedded settings, which we more relevant there for IoT type of scenarios. So all those things, again, um, uh, are uh, doable, uh, you know, when we have particularly uh, uh, com like computationally intensive applications, um, there are now uh, platforms which are designed to run uh, kind of at, at place where, for example, we may use a GPU or something like that um, on, uh, on, on that side of things. Okay, Vishal asked about, um, uh, uh, okay, so Michelle asked, how much RAM is required for running deep learning? Um, okay, so uh, if, and what about graphics card? Okay, so deep learning is very computationally intensive. And so uh, typically um, for any kind of non-trivial type of uh, uh, production, you're going to need some hardware assist. And one way to do that is with uh, a GPU, right? So, um, so a GPU, uh, is uh, going to give you about 10x generally performance, although there are some high-end CPUs now which are able to kind of approach maybe the, uh, the performance of a GPU. But yeah, GPUs are generally considered pretty essential. Um, if you don't have your own GPU, then you can actually uh, do that on the cloud, right? So that's another option as well. You can do it on the cloud. All the cloud providers pay for that. As a matter of fact, um, Google has a very nice uh, 
uh, environment called, which is very similar to Jupyter Notebook called Google uh, Co-Laboratory. Probably a lot of you have seen this before. And uh, Google Co-Laboratory um, gives you a uh, kind of a Jupyter Notebook style environment here. Um, and that Jupyter Notebook style environment. Um, uh, but one of the nice things about that is they give you access to a GPU runtime that you can run on. So for example, um, if I go here and I can go runtime, and for example, if I say change runtime type, I can say GPU, right? So, so that is very nice. Um, so, uh, so this is called Google Co-Laboratory. Yeah, so, so yeah, running on a GPU will generally give you about 10x performance improvement. And so having even kind of a relatively modest GPU uh, is still probably a worthwhile, um, a worthwhile thing, right? Just because it'll run generally so much faster than a, uh, uh, than a, uh, uh, than, than running without. Um, okay, and uh, the other, let me go back to the other question that you had here. Um, so, There actually are other options, I should say, other than GPU. What there's, for example, there's custom silicon like TPUs. Also, as I said, there are some specialized CPUs that can run fast as well. Um, so let's see. Okay, um, uh, and let me just kind of try to address whatever questions. Uh, okay, RAM. So, uh, so yes, it all depends on the size of your data and the size of your model, right? So both of those things are important things. So um, one thing is is that um, GPUs have their own memory, so you have to, and uh, that can often be a bottleneck, right? So I think um, the highest uh, consumer level GPU from NVIDIA gives you 11 GB of RAM. Um, so uh, again, you have to load your data into that relatively limited size. So that can be a problem sometimes, depending on your data size. Also, your model can be quite large. So in terms of the model, we've talked about number of trainable parameters. That basically means how many different variables in our model are we going to be able to train, right? And so, um, so again, that can be very big too. So um, there's been a lot of research lately in terms of distributed models, distributed processing, et cetera. So, um, but yeah, running RAM is good. Um, of course, when we talk about RAM, there's really two things we're talking about, right? We're talking about system RAM and GPU RAM. And they both are important, but again, a lot of it depends on your data. If your data is relatively small, then you probably don't need as much, right? So um, it just depends. But I would say, generally speaking, on a, on a workstation, you probably are going to get as much RAM as you can, right? So, I mean, RAM's fairly cheap. So, you know, 16, 32, if you could, right? That would be great if you can get that. So, um, uh, okay, so Cython, somebody asked, Cythonizing, is that a way you can create your own package? Uh, not necessarily, you don't need Cython if you don't want to. So again, but, but uh, Python packages often do contain native code. And, um, so, uh, and so Cython is a way to generate native code. Um, now, you can also mix native code with handwritten C++ code, right? So if you can handwrite C++ code, you can use Cython to compile your Python code into C++ code, right? So yeah, a lot of packages do in fact use Cython, it's very common. But you could create a package that doesn't involve any native code. It could just be pure Python, and you could create a package there as well. So there's a there's a uh, um, a, uh, a release mechanism that you can use for creating a Python module and then submitting that to PyPy or whatever way you want to do that, making it installable with pip. So it's actually pretty easy to do that. So um, uh, so can you deliver a siphonized package as an API? Certainly, right. So what you would do is you would create a Python package. You could submit that package to, Py, to PyPy, but if it's internal, what you would just do is you would just give them your package source and they could just say pip install dot basically. And then that would, pip is the package manager for Python, right? So then they could just go ahead and install that. And that, that, that release mechanism could be just pure Python code. It could be Cython code. It could be C, C++ code that you hand wrote yourself. It could be all of the above. Right, so all that could be there within uh, the Python package that you distribute to your users. Yeah. Um, so what's the best way to distribute usable code without giving away the source code? Well, um, so uh, you can definitely distribute that. So for example, um, many commercial companies like distribute Python packages. Like, so for example, if you wanna use like Microsoft SQL Server, right? So they distribute a Python package 
that if for uh, using SQL Server, you can just say pip install pymsql, right? So, or is it py, I think it's called pymsql or something like that, right? So, um, so you can get it from PyPy, but it's not open source, right? So, um, what, uh, Pyth what Microsoft no doubt does there is they're distributing uh, probably a lot of, you know, native C, C++ code, but in object file form, right? So, uh, so that is uh, going to be um, done in that way. Um, so, uh, Cython might be a good option in that case if your goal is to obfuscate your code, right? Although, if you're really concerned about obfuscation, there's some tools that you can use to further obfuscate the object code to make sure that, you know, it's not uh, easily reverse engineerable by your users. Uh, so, all those things are possible to do, um, you know. Uh, but yes, you can definitely develop and, and distribute a closed source Python package that you, your users can then develop and install and, um, you know, uh, that, uh, and, and all that is, is possible to do. Yeah, so, and Cython is, is, is one way, not the only way, but one way to do that if that's your goal. Yes. Um, okay, uh, great. All right, uh, any other questions? Okay, well, appreciate it, everyone. Um, I, uh, and I, so I think, uh, thanks everyone, you know, uh, so uh, we will be in touch with you about the recording. So um, yeah, so definitely, let me also give you my contact as well. So um, my contact here, is, you can contact me is, um, So that's my email. So you feel free to stay in touch, any questions or whatever, but I wish you all best of luck in, um, you know, in, in uh, using, uh, you know, kind of getting started with machine learning or data science or whatever else, you know, kind of uh, you're interested in, in. All right, so I'm gonna be closing the meeting then. All right, thanks everyone. Okay.